Well, good morning everyone and welcome to this online ministry from Lima Valley Reform Stream Church. Uh, we're unable to meet in our church building today uh, because of uh, COVID developments, uh, but glad we're able to join together in worshiping God over the internet. And may the Holy Spirit help us all to honor and exalt our glorious Savior in our worship this day. As we begin this morning our time of worship, let's begin by reading the first verse from the metrical version of Psalm number 32. The first verse from the metrical version of Psalm number 32 speaks about the blessing of forgiveness. How blessed is the man to whom has freely pardoned thee all the transgression he has done and covered is his sin. What a blessing to know that all your sin has been pardoned and covered over in Christ Jesus. What a good reason to join together today in praising the Lord our God. Well, let's now draw near to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you that with you there is forgiveness. If you were to mark iniquity, we could not stand. But with you, O oh God, there is forgiveness that you may be reverenced. We reverence and adore you today, O oh Lord, for that free and full forgiveness of all, all our sins given to us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise thee for him, the one who lived a life of perfect obedience and committed no sin, who lived a life that we could not live, so his righteousness can be credited to our account by faith. We praise you for him, the Lord Jesus, who died on the cruel cross at Calvary to atone for the sins of his people. So we thank you, Lord, for the tremendous joy and assurance that we have this day who believe in Jesus Christ, that all our sins have been forgiven and they will not be counted against us. Lord God, we admit that we are great sinners. We pray that we'd be aware of how, how often we do sin against you in what we think, in what we say, in what we do, and what we fail to do. In so many different ways, each day, even, O oh Lord, we confess that we do sin against you. We're utterly unworthy of the least of your mercies. I we praise and adore you, O oh gracious God, for your mercy, mercy toward us in Christ Jesus, that through him we have the incomparable blessing of the forgiveness of our sins. We praise you for Christ Jesus, the redemption that is, that is in him through his blood, the forgiveness of all our sins. And Lord God, when we think about how much you have forgiven us, may it make us far more ready to forgive others. Lord, we confess and we admit to you that we find it hard to forgive others, especially those who have hurt us more than once. We remember how our Lord Jesus and Christ the disciples to forgive one another 70 times 7 or be ready to forgive without any limit whatsoever. So we pray, Lord, that you will help us to be good at forgiving one another. We will not bear grudges. We will not store up bitterness in our hearts, but we will show mercy and forgiveness to those who do us wrong. Gracious God, we thank you that we can join together in worshiping you this day using this means of the internet. Pray that your blessing will be upon everyone listening in and you'll help us all to honor you in our praise today. We ask you to, Lord, to be near to those who are suffering from the coronavirus in these days, quite a few people known to us even. We pray, Lord, that your healing hand will be upon them. We thank you, Lord, for the doctors and nurses and care workers who are giving such dedicated care to those who are ill. Uphold them and strengthen them and keep them safe from this infection. And gracious God, we do ask that in your mercy you will look down upon our land and upon our world it won't be very long until there is a remedy, a vaccine, a cure for this virus, that Lord, in your sovereign power, you might cause this virus to be dealt with and conquered and cured. So Lord, we continue now in our worship of you, as your word is read and as your word is proclaimed this day. May it do us all good, especially 
May it help us all to re rejoice afresh in the forgiveness that is in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, and all for his glory. Amen. There are two readings from God's Word this morning. Reading first of all from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 4 and verses 1 to 8. Romans chapter 4 and verses 1 to 8. The context here is that uh, Paul has been demonstrating that righteousness comes through faith. It is not by works. And here then in the opening verses of Romans chapter 4, he gives two examples of those who are justified by faith and not by works, namely Abraham and David. And in the course of developing his argument, he quotes from Psalm 32, which we'll be reading from and thinking about in our worship <coughs> service today. So Romans chapter 4, reading verses 1 to 8. Let us hear the word of God. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this manner? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Well, we end the reading there at verse 8. You can see that those last two verses were a quotation from Psalm 32. And we're now going to read from Psalm number 32. Psalm number 32, Psalm of David. Let's again hear the word of God. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover, cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord, and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you are upright in heart. And we are reading here at verse 11, the end of Psalm number 32. Christianity, it has been said, is the religion of the forgiven. The religion of the forgiven. Forgiveness of sin lies at the very heart of Christianity. The gospel of Jesus Christ directs us to the one Jesus Christ, through whom we can obtain the sure forgiveness of all our sins. If you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, you should be experiencing this day the joy of forgiveness. You should be eager to celebrate that forgiveness 
in songs of praise. This 32nd Psalm is certainly a most appropriate one for use in both public and personal worship, for use in praising the Lord for forgiveness. As you can see, it begins with declaring the blessedness of such forgiveness. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. And it draws to a close with a call to rejoice in the Lord. So this psalm is full of the joy and the blessedness of knowing that your sins are forgiven. The very heart of Christianity is forgiveness. Let me take you through the message of this psalm by breaking it down into four parts. In the first part, which is composed of the opening two verses, we have David declaring the blessedness of forgiveness. The blessedness of forgiveness. Not once, but twice, as you can see, he declares how blessed a thing it is to know that your sins have been forgiven. And the need for such forgiveness is brought home to us by the use of three different terms convey the serious nature of sin. In the first place, there's the term transgressions, verse 1. This points to sin as a stepping over of a known boundary. A known boundary. You're not meant to cross over it, but you cross over it anyway. And we can relate to that, can't we? We know, for example, that we should not lie. We should tell the truth. And yet, and yet there's something within us, isn't there, that seems to propel us in direction of deception and falsehood. How easy we find it to tell a lie, to cross the boundary into falsehood. The second term, translated as sins, end of verse 1, expresses the idea of missing the mark missing the mark and you can relate to that too can't you you aim to do your very best but how often you find yourself falling short of even your own standards never mind god's standards how often you find yourself falling short of what you know you should be thinking of what you know you should be saying of what you know you should be doing hence god's word tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is missing the mark. And the third term, found in the second verse, verse 2, it's also translated by the word sin in the New International Version. It could be better translated as iniquity. Maybe an old-fashioned sounding word, but iniquity is a more accurate translation. That Hebrew term here, the Hebrew term here, the sense of that which is twisted, perverse, and corrupt. This reminds us that sin is very deeply entrenched in our human nature. What is referred to theologically as total depravity. That the human heart is desperately wicked. A reminder to each one of us we need to be born again by the Spirit of God or we can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So three terms here for sin. Transgressions, sins and iniquity. They should hammer home the fact to you this morning that sin is no trivial matter. It consists of deliberate rebellion against God, of abysmal moral failure and of deeply ingrained corruption. How great the need then is for you to ensure that your sins have been forgiven. And here's the good news. For David also uses three terms to get across to us the joy of forgiveness. First of all, the Hebrew word rendered as forgiven, verse 1. It means to remove or to lift or to take away. And yes, how blessed a thing to know, isn't it, that the heavy guilt of sin has been removed from you by Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sin of the world. 
how blessed you are to know that in him your sins have even been removed as far as east is distant from the west. And then there's the term covered, also in verse 1. Whose sins are covered. The idea of sin being put out of sight, being covered over. Sin atoned for and covered over by the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. We could relate this to the wonderful picture. You could look it up later on in Micah chapter 7 verse 19. Where you read of how the Lord hurls the iniquities of his people into the depths of the sea. Into the depths of the sea. Totally out of sight. They're not going to bring brought bring, they're not going to be brought back up. Totally out of sight. And there's another term here where we read how the Lord does not count sin against his people. Verse 2. Who sin the Lord does not count against him. So forgiveness is therefore portrayed as the lifting or the taking away of a burden. The covering over of an ugly sight and the cancelling of a debt. How well that ties in with the passage you read in Romans chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. We have the good news that God graciously justifies us through faith in Jesus Christ. How blessed it is then for you to know this day that in Jesus the guilt of your sin has been removed, covered over, cancelled out. And even more than that, you are reckoned righteous in the sight of a holy God. The blessedness of forgiveness. Let's look now at the second part of the psalm. It extends from verse 3 down as far as verse 7. We have David emphasizing the need for confession. The need for confession. This section begins with a very vivid description of the consequences of failing to confess one's sin. Look at verses 3 and 4. David tells us about the heavy burden of guilt that had been weighing him down when he failed to confess his sin. Do you see how he conveys the painful consequences of having kept silent about his sin? That he had no peace of mind. That he had to contend with a, a tortured conscience. And this had an impact indeed even on his physical well-being. Look at the references there to bones wasting away, to groaning throughout the day, to feeling his strength ebbing away. If you look at the end of verse 4, you'll see a very telling image used to express how weak David had become, how his strength had become sapped, as in the heat of summer. That's a very vivid picture. Imagine if you can, and I know this may not happen that often in our particular climate, but imagine if you can having to embark on a very, very long walk on a very, very, very hot day with the sun beating down upon you. It wouldn't be that long until you would find yourself being worn out with all the heat of the sun beating down upon you. Your strength sapped as in the heat of summer. Maybe, or maybe you've seen some of those cowboy films where the cowboy ends up having to trudge through a desert and he falls down in total exhaustion. That's how David felt. He felt that his strength had sapped away as if he'd been in, in the heat of summer. The burden of his guilt was totally wearing him out. As he writes elsewhere in Psalm 38 and verse 4, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. A burden too heavy to bear. And that's what guilt can be like for people. Psychiatrists tell us about guilt complexes and what they can do to people. Countless patients have ended up upon a psychiatric couch because they have been haunted by their guilt. One study has even shown the average person can end up wrestling with five hours of guilt every week. Other studies have shown how guilt can significantly impact our levels of concentration, creativity and efficiency. 
and many cases have demonstrated how feelings of guilt can arise from things that have occurred in one's life in the far distant past, even way back in the days of childhood. 1950, there was a film released called Guilt is My Shadow. Guilt is My Shadow. It portrayed in a very powerful manner how a woman was haunted by guilt down the years because she'd actually killed a man and hidden his body. Yes, she managed to hide the body so nobody could find it, but she couldn't bury her guilt. It cast such a long shadow over her life that it drove her to a nervous breakdown. Guilt can cast very long shadows over a person's life. It's not just murderers either who are haunted by the long shadow of guilt. Maybe even some of you today are still being haunted by some type of unconfessed sin going all the way back to your earlier days, maybe many years ago. Issues that you need to deal with. Issues that you need to bring before God. The burden of guilt can deprive you of sleep. The burden of guilt can take away your peace. The burden of guilt can even drive you mad. Tragically, the burden of guilt can even lead to people committing suicide. David had certainly been heavily burdened by his guilt, a burden that kept on increasing the longer he remained silent. Many commentators suggest the scenario in view here was the time in David's life when he committed the drastic sin of adultery with Bathsheba. And rather than admitting his guilt immediately, he kept silent for a considerable period of time. For almost a year, in fact, he had not acknowledged it until confronted with the devastating words of Nathan the prophet, You are the man. That brought David to his senses. That convicted him of his sin. But for quite a period of time, he'd, try and, he'd been trying to suppress that and bearing a heavy burden as a result. And this, will, this is what will happen to you if you do not confess your sins. How tempting it can be to try to evade guilt, to excuse it. How pride can lead us to denying or excusing our sin. But if we do so, the consequences will not be pleasant. On the other hand, humble prayer to God, confessing our sins, is the key to restoring peace. For you can see how David moves on then in verse 5 to tell us about the happy consequence of confessing his sins. What happened when he confessed his sins? What happened when he said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord? Look what he says at the end of verse 5. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. And that's exactly what we are assured of, aren't we? First John chapter 1, verse 9. These richly reassuring words for sinners such as we are. We're told, if we confess our sins, he that is the Lord is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The Lord, you see, is so unlike human beings. We can be so slow, so slow to grant forgiveness to those who have wronged them. Your Lord is faithful and just, graciously ready to give you your sins and purify you from all unrighteousness. Having confessed his sins and been assured of forgiveness, you can see from verses 6 and 7, David then urges others to be quick to turn to the Lord in prayer. Here we have him saying to everyone who is godly that they should pray to the Lord while he may be found. An echo here, surely, of the well-known words of Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Here is the encouragement we have to confess our sins. We can turn to the Lord knowing that he's ready to abundantly pardon his people. So don't be slow to confess your sins. Don't keep putting it off. 
as has been wisely pointed out, we should keep short accounts with God. We should keep short accounts with God. So dear friends, let's not only be quick to confess our own sins, let's encourage others also to show the importance of confession. As has been famously remarked, confession is good for the soul. From the psalm you can see that such a claim is true in the deepest and most profound manner for all those who are in Christ Jesus. So far then, there's been the blessedness, forgiveness, the need for confession. And now in the third part of the psalm, that's verses 8 and 9, we have the promise of guidance. The promise of guidance. There's some debate here among the commentators in relation to identifying the voice that is speaking in verse 8, whether it's the voice of a priest or a voice of the Lord speaking directly to David, probably the latter. Whichever it may be, there's no doubt that the verse contains a very encouraging promise of guidance. The Lord is not only ready to forgive us for the sins of the past, he is willing to guide us and direct us for the future. Here you have the promise of the Lord. You see it there? To instruct, to guide, to counsel, and to watch over his servant. And note especially the phrase at the end of verse 8. The phrase at the end of verse 8. It's translated in the international version, I will watch over you. That's lovely in itself, but it could be more literally translated, My eye will be upon you. My eye will be upon you. It might make us think of a, a loving mother keeping a close eye upon her child, to make sure that the child doesn't get into bother, keeping her eye. The Lord is well able to see all the challenging situations that you find yourself in. He's well aware of the temptations that you face and he has his eye upon you to help you to deal with them, to overcome them, to lead you and guide you. How encouraged that ought, be, ought to be for all of us. We have erred, gone astray, have to confess our sins, but we can look ahead. We need not despair about the potential for future usefulness in the Lord's service. We can look to the Lord to lead us and guide us afresh into his ways. So you should not only ask the Lord to forgive you for the sins of the past, but as you serve him with new resolve and new determination, you should be asking him, Lord, instruct me. Lord, teach me in the way that I should go. Lord, counsel me. Lord, keep your eye upon me. So we ask here is an encouraging promise of guidance. But we do need to notice the caveat, the qualification in verse 9. The children's talk and colour in sheet, by the way, are about this verse. Verse 9 tells us that we're not to be like the horse or the mule. And you can see that there's a mention of their lack of understanding. This implies we need to keep asking the Lord for understanding and discernment so, we, so that we will be able to grasp and then to follow the guidance that the Lord gives us. But there could be more to it than that. That this verse is not just highlighting our need to ask for understanding. It's also warning us not to be stubborn or resistant to the Lord's will. We're not to have the stubborn attitude of the horse. Suppose we've got the saying, don't we? You can take a horse to water, but you cannot make it drink. Or the mule, they must be pulled along with a bit or a bridle, or they will not go in the direction that you want them to go in. We're definitely aware, aren't we, of the saying, the proverbial saying, as stubborn as a mule. As stubborn as a mule. In other words, you and I are reminded here of the need to have a teachable and readily obedient attitude. Close parallel can be found in Psalm 51, also a psalm where David was confessing his sin, but then he prays, Renew a steadfast spirit within me, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. A willing spirit. 
In other words, while there's certainly here a great promise of guidance to encourage us, we still need to be asking the Lord for the ability to discern and the readiness to follow that guidance. Time to move on then to the last part of the psalm, looking at verses 10 and 11. As well as the blessedness of forgiveness, the need for confession, and the promise of guidance, we have the assurance of love. The assurance of love. More precisely, it is the assurance of the Lord's love that David has in mind. Why can David be so confident that his sins have been forgiven, that his guilt has been removed? Well, verse 10 shows us it's because of his trust in the Lord's unfailing love. But the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. And as you can see, this verse contains a startling contrast. What a, a, what, what a startling contrast there is here between the woes of the wicked man, on the one hand, and the godly man who is assured of being surrounded by the love of the Lord. It's important we don't overlook the first part of this verse. But I must say to you that those who have no trust in the Lord not, not only lack any remedy for their guilt, and that will impose many woes upon them in this life, but they will have to face the righteous judgment of God in relation to it. What a contrast there is between the woes of the wicked and the blessedness of those who have been forgiven. You need to be sure that you've been delivered from the woes of the wicked, that you put your trust in the unfailing love of God. How comforting you know, as the verse tells us, that the Lord surrounds, surrounds the one who trusts in him with his unfailing love. The same Hebrew word had actually been used earlier on, verse 7, verse 7, where David rejoiced in the prospect of being surrounded by songs of deliverance. That's probably a reference to David being surrounded by his fellow worshippers as he thankfully acknowledges the Lord's gracious dealings with him. But now he speaks of being surrounded by something that is much more wonderful. Surrounded by the Lord's unfailing love. It's a great thing to be surrounded by people who love. How much more wonderful to be surrounded by the Lord's unfailing love. And the close link between the Lord's unfailing love and the assurance of forgiveness can be seen clearly in another well-known psalm. I'm sure you're familiar with Psalm 103. In verse 11 of that psalm, we have the glorious picture of the Lord removing our transgressions from us as far as east is from the west. But do you recall what immediately precedes that assurance of sin has been removed? Yes, it is preceded by a reference to the greatness of God's love. For verse 10 of Psalm 103 says this, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. So you see how the infinite removal of sin flows from the immensity of God's love. It shouldn't surprise us then that here in this 32nd Psalm, David moves on from speaking about the blessedness of forgiveness to speaking about his trust in the Lord's unfailing love. Yes, guilt can cast the wrong shadow. But what a measure of joy and peace belongs to the one who trusts in the Lord's unfailing love. It's sometimes the case, isn't it, that human beings tell us that because they love us, they've been able to forgive us for the wrong we have done to them. And it's a wonderful thing, so it is. It is a wonderful thing to know that you have been genuinely forgiven by another human being. Sometimes, sadly, however, people may say that they have forgiven you at the time. They may even mean it at the time. But later on, you find out they've not really been able to forgive you. They still hold a grudge. They're still holding a hurt. Their love has fallen short. As human beings, we find it really hard to fully and permanently forgive those who have really hurt us. Our hearts are not big enough and loving enough of them to smother the hurt. But you see, the love of the Lord 
will never avail the truly repentant sinner, and your sins against him will not be held against you on that judgment day. In Jesus Christ, they have been fully washed away. In Jesus Christ, they have been totally obliterated. In Jesus Christ, they have been completely cancelled out. It is this assurance of the Lord's unfailing love that causes David to conclude them on such a joyful note. Rejoice in the Lord, he says, and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all oh, you're upright in heart. David urges others to join with him in a song of joyful praise to the Lord, in the light of the Lord's forgiveness and the Lord's unfailing love. Yes, this 32nd Psalm is usually classified as a penitential psalm or penitential song, for it does deal with the painful reality of unconfessed sin. But we should also see that it ends, it begins and it ends on a very, very joyful note. Psalm teaches us at least two lessons. I want you to reflect upon these today. Firstly, it should bring home to you that you do need to take your sin very seriously, that you do need to confess your sin. It should cause you even to ask yourself, do I confess my sins? Do I regularly confess my sins? How much of a place does confession of sin have in my life? Does it feature in my prayers? Do I feel sorrow, sorrow for ways in which I feel God? Secondly, the psalm should teach you about the blessedness of forgiveness, the joy of forgiveness, assuring you of the Lord's unfailing love. And so may it cause you to sing with joy this day that in Christ Jesus you have redemption, the forgiveness of your sins. Dear friends, as you look to Jesus Christ this day, with the eyes of faith, surely you can join with us now in singing most heartily such words as these, the opening words of this inspired song of praise. How blessed is the man to whom has freely pardoned thee all the transgression he has done and covered is his sin. Praise be to the Lord joy, the blessing of forgiveness. So let's now sing in praise to the Lord the words of Psalm number 32, the opening six stanzas. Let's sing praise to the Lord. Yeah. 
is now concluding prayer. Lord God, thank you for this inspired psalm of praise, psalm that highlights for us the blessedness and the joy of forgiveness. We praise you today again, O Lord, for Jesus Christ the Saviour. We praise it in him and all who believe in him have full and free forgiveness of all their sins. Lord, help us uh, to sense and experience something of the joy of that forgiveness even this very day. And help us also, Lord, to be always ready to confess our sins to you, knowing that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And now may the blessing of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. And just to say that the, the evening service this evening will be looking at the creation hope, the hope for the for creation based on passage in Romans uh, chapter 8.